There we go. Yeah. Oh, look at all the little blinking bubbles. Oh, there we go. Ah, Kim's, Kim's made it back. Okay, well, how about we'll get started with um, some quick little introductions and as people bounce in, I can fill them in in the chat. Um, so welcome everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us today. We're really excited to be hosting this session. Uh, judging by the attendee list, we probably will learn more from you all than you will from us, but I love discussion. I think it's a great way of just bouncing ideas off of each other. So this should be fun. Um, so I'm Nick, my pronouns are she, her, and I am a part of my youth initiative known as Thrive Like a Girl, which I started through the Pathy Foundation Fellowship at the Cody Institute this past year. Um, my lovely co-hosts today are Adriana and Sydney, who can introduce themselves at the end. But just to get started, if each of you could just popcorn style, introduce who you are, um, where you're from in the world, what your background is in activism work, whether it's specific to reproductive health or not, and then just something you're grateful for today. Does it sound a lot like the Cody? <laughs> Okay, I'll go. Uh, just to get things rolling, Gord Cunningham, I'm uh, with the Cody Institute. I don't have any background in reproductive health, but lots in community economic development. And most importantly for this workshop, I'm from the Niagara Peninsula. I grew up in St. Catharines. Mm -hmm. My mom was from the Hammer, Hamilton, Ontario. Yeah. I'll go. Um, hi, I'm Kim Hopes. Um, I'm in Evanston, Illinois, and I'm with the ABCD Institute. And um, I know my connection with reproductive health is being a woman and a mother of two daughters. <laughs> um, and um, I'm grateful to be here today. And I've been to, I think, six or seven of these in the last two days, and it, they've been wonderful. Yeah. And I'm grateful that my, my internet just went out and it turned out just that my husband kicked it and it, it accidentally turned off. So I was able to fix it. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll go next. Uh, my name is uh, Mebo Birengo. I'm from Nairobi, Kenya. Um, first of all, I've been locked out of my city for going to four months now, living in a rural community. Uh, in eastern part of Kenya. Uh, I have a background in monitoring and evaluation and I'm, um, um, I'm a consultant in development. Um, my experience with reproductive health, I think because I'm a woman, but also I do a lot of work with uh, women groups and women um, uh, livelihood development processes and projects. Uh, that's, but I don't have any professional experience in that area. I am a learner. And I would uh, just say I'm grateful for today because this is my ninth session that I'm joining uh, since this conference began. So, yay! And I'm making some tea. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. I'll, um, I'll go next. So, um, I'm Michelle Dunscombe from the Yeda Institute, and I'm coming from a little village. Um, called King Lake, which is on the lands of the, the Tanarung people of the Kulin Nation. Um, and when I say little, it's the population of my town is 1500. So it, it's a small rural town, but it's not, it's not far from Melbourne. So, um, and obviously, besides being a woman, um, I'm also a chair of a women's group here um, in Victoria. Um, and what am I grateful for today? I'm grateful that this is the last session. So my bed is not far away. So I'm looking forward to that. Hi, Mrs. Dara Michelle. Uh, it is quarter past four in the morning. <laughs> I'll pick up what Michelle said, but not in Michelle's house. Um, so I'm Fiona and I'm part of the Yeda Institute and I'm on Palawa land in, ta on, in Tasmania and it's 
it's just been amazing what we're doing. Um, I have a history in community development and parent education and support working with maternal child health nurses. So have done a lot of work once bubbies have come, but also um, other things like that have kicked in. I'm a mum of two kids. I've just become a grandmother for the first time. And that was a bit different for me because we, we have an IVF bubby. So we've been through all of those things as well. Um, always interested in what's going on everywhere and grateful. And Michelle sort of stole my thunder, but I was going to say my pillow because like I know it's there waiting for me. So yeah, he's back. Okay, um, sorry, I said, would you like to introduce yourself? For sure, so um, Sid or Sydney, whatever you like to call me. Um, I am from Ontario, Canada, and my background in uh, sexual reproduction health is mainly being a woman, but also I did a degree at St. Francis Xavier um, in Women's and Gender Studies as well as just being a part of Nicola's program with Thrive Like a Girl. Um, those are my kind of background. And then today I'm grateful for doing this today. It's so awesome and be able to be part of something like the Unconference. Um, so super excited and awesome to, just can't wait to hear from you all. So it's what I'm grateful for. Adriana, is the lawnmower done? No, can you hear it? Is it loud? Okay, I'm, I'm on a base, I'm like in a basement apartment, so it's really loud all the time. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm Adriana. Um, I am also from Ontario. I grew up in Hamilton and Burlington, and um, I've I've been friends with Nicola for like more than 10 years now. So our, we have a lot in common. Um, however, I don't have a, an educational background in um, reproductive health, but I am a woman, so there's that. And I also help out with Drive Like a Girl with Nicola. And um, I'm a photographer by, that's my job. Um, yeah, and what I'm grateful for is uh, the beautiful weather that we've been having lately. So, yeah. Great. So, just one second. Okay. So, yeah. I'm Nick. I just to give you a little bit of background. I live in Jordan, Ontario, which is outside of St. Catharines in Niagara Peninsula. Um, it's lovely, I live in wine country, so you're constantly surrounded by vines, and of course, wine, if you'd like to drink, so that's nice. Um, I was born in Hamilton, so I also get the Hamilton connection, and my background in sexual reproductive health is quite extensive, considering I'm only 25. I started working in, yes, exactly, Balls Falls. I live two minutes from there. Um, but yeah, so I started working in reproductive health when I was, about 19 years old, uh, doing some research programs through the University of Ottawa. I then did my undergraduate honors thesis in exploring long acting reversible contraception use in Canada for anyone ages 15 and older. And um, when I ended up not getting into medical school after my undergrad, I decided to do a master's degree at U Ottawa as well in interdisciplinary health sciences, where I specialized in rural health and the access to contraception. 
So that's where my niche work with adolescents really started to come to fruition. I focused my work mainly with 13 to 19 year olds, looking at if they have access to contraception and if they do, are they able to access it without uh, parental involvement? Because here in Ontario at 16 years old, you have medical consent and you're of age of majority, but as young as 13, you can gain access to contraception without the need for a parent or guardian, provided that you can demonstrate you have um, a knowledge and understanding of what the device or medication is going to be doing for your body. So yeah, so I'm, I love it. Um, outside of research, I actually work for the American Society for Emergency Contraception based in the United States. So we do on-campus activism for access to uh, emergency contraception through student grassroots organizations, which is why I love grassroots work. I think it's so phenomenal what young leaders are doing in our communities around the world. And I'm excited to learn more from all of you. Um, so just a little housekeeping. If you haven't noticed, we are recording. My high school prom, was it actually? Sorry. <laughs> oh, Beacon Hotel, yeah. Yeah, I know exactly where that is. Sorry, I do have the attention span of a squirrel some days. I will not deny that. So anyways, um, we are- My apologies, everybody, for throwing Nick off with it. No, that's totally fine. Um, if you don't feel comfortable being on camera, that's totally fine. However, we do love face-to-face -face interactions. Definitely makes it easier when you're in a virtual setting. I'm just going to throw it out there, and I'm sure all of you are, but we are definitely an all-inclusive space. So if you would like to share what pronouns you go by, um, please feel free to. Otherwise, we're all accepting. We have no qualms and we want the space to feel safe and brave for anybody who would like to share anything. Um, at the end of the session, we will take the group photo. So again, if you don't want to be on the video, you can turn it off, but please note your name will be seen in the photo. And then, yeah, we're just, in this session, we want to create a genuine open space for conversation. Um, if there's anything that you want to specifically address that we haven't brought up, please feel free to send us a message or ask it over audio. This is as much for us as it is for you, and it's totally flexible. We have some like set questions we'd like to cover, but other than that, we're happy to adapt as needed. Um, so we have a couple people who still haven't introduced yourself. So Brianne, if you would like to just run through who you are, where you're from, um, and your background in reproductive health activism and what you're grateful for today, you're more than welcome. Thanks, um, nice to see you. Yes. Uh, I am Brianne Peters and I work at the Cody Institute with, along with Gord and I think Robin's in here too. Sorry, I was late, I was, um, I've been online for the last basically 30 hours um, uh, for the, all of the other sessions. Uh, and so I've been jumping around and I didn't want to miss your session. Uh, so um, uh, actually, so this is a relatively like specific and new area for me. I've been working with Robin on a project called Start for Girls uh, in Zimbabwe, looking at um, um, sexual and uh, reproductive health rights of, of, of girls in um, uh, in Zimbabwe. Uh, and so I did not want to miss this. And so I'm very grateful to be here with all of you today. So thanks for doing it, Nick. Thanks for coming. I'm glad to see some familiar faces. Yeah. And then, I'm sorry, I, I believe it's pronounced Juan, Wanha. Are you able to speak with your audio? Um, I'm actually messaging with Wanya at the moment. Um, she can hear, um, but, but she's having some challenges. So um, Wanya, I know you can hear, I'll just introduce her quickly. Wanya is from, from Kenya. So she's a community development um, worker in Kenya and she is one of the International Association of Community Development, so IACD. She's one of their Kenyan country correspondents. So, and hopefully, again. yeah, if she can get connected so she can, can contribute, I'm sure she will. Fantastic. Well, for any of the um, discussion-based stuff, if you would like to throw your answer in the chat, I'm happy to, or one of us will monitor it and make sure that we can share it with everyone in case we're not all looking at the chat at the same time. Great. 
Yeah, so today we'll be looking at three sections of grassroots action. Uh, so first we want to just brainstorm as collective what grassroots action means to each and every one of us. Of course, there is a general definition, but it can look uh, differently or be in different capacities depending on the type of work that you've participated in in the past. We will then talk about some common like barriers or hurdles that uh, you've either experienced yourself or are afraid of experiencing, especially if you're a newer organization or newer project starting up, and how we could potentially overcome these or prepare to overcome them in the future. And then we want to end off with a small group discussion, just talking about sustainability in action um, and really mainly focusing on how to care for yourself as a leader to make sure that you are at your top health and responsiveness for your own personal lives, but also in the work that you're doing. So uh, I see your breakout room question. No, I have, they're good. We're all good. So to get things started, if you have access to another tab on your browser, that would be fantastic um, because we will be doing a word cloud live time right now. So we'll give you about five minutes to just plug in some words that represent what grassroots means to you. Um, and I will copy the link into the chat for everyone now. And then I will share, hold on, how do I share? There we go, everyone. And then I will share my screen so you guys can see the cloud um, popping up as it comes along. So if you follow that link, it should bring you to the voting section where you just type in up to five words each time, but you can submit multiple times if you have more than five words. Okay, great. So there are some awesome words here um, and little phrases, and I see that they're still coming in. So we'll give you about another minute or so to continuously add, or you can keep adding even in background when we start uh, talking more about this. But I realize the colors are not very great. I'm sorry, I didn't choose the right background color.
Okay. Um, so I'll make sure that we have a copy of that image um, in the driver accessible to anybody who'd like to see it afterwards. Um, but it's a great start. I mean, I, I really appreciate uh, progress at local levels, self-initiated initiated change, um, something sparked it. Yeah, I really like that because it's, it is a really um, flammable experience to be in a grassroots action organization. Uh, you just kind of starts out of nowhere. So as some of us may know, it's used, grassroots movements are often used by the people of a region or a community um, as the basis for social, political, or economic change. Organizations usually use collective action from the local level to affect change at either the local, regional, national, or even international level, depending on how large the organization grows. Um, and the best thing about grassroots action is it's a bottom up approach. So everything that's made on a decision basis starts from your community leaders and it's not somebody doing it for you rather than you're doing it with them. Um, so uh, around the world, grassroots action has been at the forefront of sexual and reproductive health activism um, from as far as I can remember from stories that I've learned. So whether it's reform in Ireland uh, surrounding the abortion rights to the de decriminalization of abortion in Chile, um, to women in Argentin Argentina recognizing that miscarriages are not a crime, um, to even the amplification of the voices of sexual assault survivors in South Sudan, women and people who support these um, missions around the world have been doing anything they can to elevate their voices and effectively create change in their communities. So the achievements of grassroots organizations are not isolated when one is able to do something as small as changing how people see something or their perception of, you know, whatever that social injustice is, it paves the way for other action and other movements to do what they need to do. So Using that, we'd like to have an open discussion as a group um, over five, or sorry, four different questions that we've come up with, unless any of you would like to change it up. And our first open discussion question is, uh, what about grassroots action entices you to lead in your social justice role? So I'm happy to start from my experience to get the juices flowing. Um, I think when I first got into reproductive health work, uh, you see, I, okay, let's start somewhere else. In social injustices, you often see politics heavily involved and uh, it can be really difficult for communities to navigate that space of trying to rely on their political system to support them rather than or and also balancing the ability to make a change yourself so when i started working uh, in ottawa as a community with our on-campus group it was really inspiring to watch these older students because we were all students at the time be able to make changes on our own our on our own campus which was a school of forty five thousand students so that's a huge community when you think about it being a small group of like 10 or 11 people trying to make change and it started with just being able to open our administrators eyes to, in this particular case, um, the sexual or the sexualization of female students, both on campus and at other schools. So to give you some context, my school's hockey team when I was in second year of university was accused of um, sexually assaulting three women in a different city during a hockey tournament. And that resulted in our school pushing back and asking the administrators to cancel the hockey program which actually did happen and they were able to do it in two years or for two full seasons so it was really amazing to see that as young small students who are often told we're numbers we actually made change in our community and we taught these people that this is not okay we need you to represent us as administrators as our leaders and create and foster a space that is safe for everyone
I think for me in grassroots and having worked with the maternal child health and parent education side of things, sometimes the fear of asking a question as a community person or a member of a group can be really challenging. So building the relationship, if it's my role to do that, is building the relationship first and then allowing a space for those conversations to come out and then supporting supporting the changes that they're looking for or what their need is um, and just being compassionate as well to what needs to happen. Provide information, have the resources available um, and, and do all those types of things. Um, so letting it grow with what the group or the person needs it to be. So that's where my role in grassroots would be in sitting in that space. Yeah, you're right. It can be such a challenging space to navigate because um, even if you're a member of that community, you may not feel like you're always the right person to be leading, right? Um, and one of my favorite things that I learned actually through the Cody Institute was this idea of not being like a shepherd with all your sheep following you, but being the last sheep in the group, pushing everyone forward and letting them elevate their voices or ask the questions that they need to. And grassroots action is a great place to be able to do that because you can give them the confidence without having to lead for them. You just give them this space even as much as saying, okay, go ahead, talk. And all of a sudden all these different fantastic ideas come out. Next thing you know, you're six months down the line making something change and it's fantastic. I think for me, what entices me is um, the fact that the communities that I work with or that I've been linked to um, have been communities that have known me for quite some time. Uh, I don't live in them, but I connect with them. It could be directly or um, through teams that live around there or something. So there's uh, that sense of trust. Uh, when I am present, there's a, uh, a trust that I've been um, accorded as a person, as an outsider. They feel that I'm one of them in some ways. Um, so I think that trust is what uh, gives me the freedom to know that I am able to stimulate a response in an area or in a community and it will be sustained and the people will take it seriously. Um, I have a relationship with those who are in front, with the local leaders, um, with the chair ladies uh, in most of the groups that I'm with. And so I think uh, the assurity that uh, I already have a team that we could work together in terms of uh, sustained and owned responses. Uh, gives me, yeah, it gives me a comfort in some ways. Uh, so just the, the fact that that setup is that way because of the past relationships I've had and the reputation I have with the team, uh, it gives me just that, you know, wanting to do more. Um, and also I think my, my, bra my background in monitoring and evaluation, you know, where you're wanting uh, to have good systems that are um, strength-based uh, using appreciative inquiry processes when you're working with local communities. I think that also, um, yeah, it pushes me, it excites me to know that because of the relationship I have, it's possible to set up systems that uh, will be sustained or projects that will be sustained, programs that will be owned uh, at grassroots level. And it's not a mebo thing but it's a community-led process in a way. So that's, yeah, that's, I hope I'm making sense. <laughs> Absolutely. And can you talk a little bit about how you were able to establish that trust with communities that you're not living in? Um, thank you, that's a good question. I, um, I began by being invited. I was part of a team that, uh, a global team that did a lot of work on community facilitation and uh, building facilitation teams across different Salvation Army territories in Africa. Um, and through that, Kenya was a, a very good learning ground where other territories used to come to learn, hey, how are you guys doing your community mobilization? How are you guys developing youth capacity, youth, young people? How are you guys doing uh, like having 
strong entry points into local communities. So one of the community here in Kenya um, used to invite us to come and facilitate work with young people around HIV and AIDS, um, around microfinance, um, you know, small income generating activities. And through that, so I used to come like um, every month, I'd come maybe twice. Uh, so the relationship began to build there. So over time, as uh, other projects began, as other responses began in the area and other areas through transfer, um, my name was very popular. And I, in fact, like right now, for the four months I've been out of Nairobi, I've been living in one of those communities. Um, and I've been able to stimulate conversations around aging. That's been the thing that we've been talking about. You know, we are all getting old. How are you preparing in your old age? What do you need to put in place? How are you preparing for your future? What was in the past that is really good that we need to carry forward as we live into old age? Um, it's been an amazing process and they've been inviting me to do that, but it's because of those past responses and connections uh, with the people that I'm working with that has enabled that to unfold well. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, yeah, aging is a very interesting topic. I mean, I everything I do is in sexuality and reproductive health, but recently I've been reading some papers on how to have those conversations with the aging population. And uh, yeah, there's, there's definitely some improvements needed in prepping people for their older ages and how they can still manage their um, functionalities or their quality of life as they get older. Um, is there anyone else that would like to share on this question? Okay, so the next question we have for you um, is, what grassroots organizations are you aware of that participate in reproductive health activism in your community? So it can be um, the organization you work with specifically and programs that you're working on or just like generally some organizations that exist that you've heard of and even maybe don't know very much about them, but they exist. I actually don't know any. The only place I can think of in this area is we have a women's health clinic and it's actually a really, really challenging um, process to get seen there. Um, if you're seeing, if, we're, if you're seeing a GP here at the moment and you've got your health management plan through your GP, they'll often refer you back you know, if you go to the Women's Health Clinic, I will refer you back to your GP. And that's to do with the crisis of health here. So the access to what we have got, um, medical profession-wise and just profession-wise in those different areas. So sometimes it can take a long time to be seen as well um, or to be linked to services you need. I don't know, Nick, if you, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Brianne. I don't know if you, when you were in Anganesh, but I find the Anganesh Women's Resource Center to be very, uh, it's like straddles the gap between being grassroots and also an institution that provides sort of healthcare at the same time, you know? So it's, it's not just something that you go to when you're sick, but something that you participate in on an ongoing basis, you know, and they, um, uh, they're full of really strong women, you know, there's like a little library in there if you just feel like going and reading a book on your lunch hour or whatever. Um, yeah, I think, and I've lived, um, you know, in Annie Anish for you know, over a decade and I couldn't get a doctor. And um, and I, I called up and they said, yeah, we have an, a nurse practitioner, right? So if you don't need anything like really serious. So I, I you know, the access is good. The um, the people who work there are great uh, and very connected. So anyway, that's my two cents. 
Yeah, I, I never had the privilege of um, visiting the center, but I had heard about it while I was in Antigonish. And it, it is important to recognize that institutions that are dedicated to Women's Health Center can, in fact, sometimes have like that bridge over with grassroots action. And especially if they're in like a educational aspect as well, if they're offering groups for, you know, uh, new moms with young babies or uh, teenagers that want to learn more about their sexuality. That's often led by somebody in the community who, in fact, is trying to make a change at the grassroots action. So it's definitely worth recognizing the Women's Health Centers. They are often awesome. Uh, but Fiona, going back to your comment about the health crisis, is that an insurance issue for individuals? No. We have free health care here. Okay. Yeah. Like, I was just yeah. going to say we have free health care. That's it. Think of Obamacare at the next level. That's what we have. So, yeah, yeah. I can't believe the system you guys have over there, particularly in the States. Yeah. Um, it's the NHS, right, in Australia? No, no. It's me we have Medicare. Medicare. Oh. Yeah. Right. Ours is where I live at the moment. One of the challenges is we don't have enough professional people down here. Okay. So um, the, the island of Tasmania that sits off the bottom, there's only 650,000 of us on the whole island. Oh, wow. So they've, and I'm at the top end just out of Launceston. The bottom is Hobart. Hobart's the capital. So we actually even, not for, but my, my husband, we, ha we've, we have to travel to Hobart for some of, his specialist appointments, which is three hour drive away, because that's that's where the professionals are. We don't have enough professional services down here. So we have a nursing shortage, we have a, a doctor shortage, and especially a lot of those, we have a lot of people, especially um, challenging um, health issues, cancers and things like that, that will fly to the mainland for their treatments. Um, I think, Nick, uh, uh, to answer your question as well, um, for the four months that I've been here, I have noticed uh, three things in relation to your question. Uh, the first one is definitely what um, I think Fiona and others have shared around, you know, those institutions, like uh, there's a health clinic, uh, there's actually like two health clinics, uh, there's one maternity, uh, that's the first level. Um, the second level I've noticed um, there is sort of like a local community midwife kind of setup system um, and this is done in just uh, part of the village in where like a small town in the village it's not a health um, institution per se but it's a community uh, midwife kind of setup and there's a lady who's experienced and what I've had uh, for the time I've been here is that she's been doing that for years and people trust her. She has rooms, she takes care of the women, she takes care of the children. Um, so that's like part two of what I've seen. The third aspect of, um, of this uh, answer to your question is there are different group settings that are, uh, they come together for different purposes. There are others who are really specific on, um, we want to do a catering business, to earn a living, Others do, um, there's a group that makes uh, recycled magazine products. They make jewelry and stuff and they sell to whoever will buy. Um, but part of those conversations include issues around reproductive health. It's, uh, you know, the mentoring of mothers to small young girls uh, around reproductive health and sexuality. And that happens in a really informal setting, sort of like a sharing of generation learning um, like sort of like a, a relay, uh, you're running a relay, somebody's handing you the pattern, somebody else is handing you the pattern, something like that. But the learning happens really informally. So those three options are the, what I've seen uh, in the four months that I've been staying here in the village. That's fantastic. I love the idea of intergenerational sharing. Um, you know, there can be myths, like I have some myths my mom taught me when I was younger, like having to wear cotton underwear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a fantastic book. At the end of this, it's by Dr. Jen Gunter. It's called The Vagina Bible. 100% recommend it. I think every 
woman or individual with the uterus should read it because it's just nice. What what is it called again? The vagina what? The vagina bible. <laughs> yeah. So she's a um, she's an OBGYN who decided to write a book debunking all these different myths that women across the world believe. And I was reading it. I'm like, oh my gosh, my mom and grandmother yeah, taught me all these myths. Why did I not know this? And this is what I do. So <laughs> me too. she's, she's got a good sense of humor. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just like something I picked up on in some of your comments is like for rural community specifically, um, there's a shortage of healthcare providers. And I think you see that in quite a few uh -huh. um, different contexts. So of course, because you're at a shortage of providers for, you know, your, your normal, normal, I'll use specialties like cardiology, reproductive mm. health is often forgotten. Right. So it can be really difficult to identify what you have accessible to you in your community from like a healthcare aspect. And then even more difficult to identify those grassroots actions who are trying to affect change, but they just aren't getting anywhere because there's not a lot there to support them. And we'll right. talk a little bit more about barriers in the next section. Um, but unless anybody else has something on this question, we have just a final like general question on why you think grassroots action is so important to social activism in general. Uh, could you please repeat the question again? Yep. Uh, just why you think grassroots action is so important to social activism. It's where it all starts. Yeah, if, you know, um, it's, you know, of the people, by the people, you know. Um, so I think that yeah it's where all activism starts is at that that grassroots level it's those you know um the first dancing guy you know that first person and then the the, the followers that come after um and we need those you know we need those people in our community to be brave and we need to support people um but yeah it's it's you know grassroots is where it all starts because you know then they're, they're not sitting in parliament thinking about how they can be activists mm -hmm. um and in, in, and for a lot of politicians that's a, that's like a, a dirty word like activists oh, yeah. are, are problems to to quiet um yeah so for me it's 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 where it's at mm -hmm. and it's a way for people like you're saying who don't have necessarily power because they're not in Politi politics or or uh, to it's a more it's an even playing field for starting something you know mm. i think also it's um i want to agree like def with what michelle is also saying uh it, it is the it is the foundation i think um maybe just as the word says grassroots the roots it is the foundation of what uh, real is of what life is i think grassroots uh, actions are are sustainable i think grassroots actions are um they have so much power and so they are solid in terms of what they stand for i know a community that said no to donor funding because they didn't believe that would uh strengthen what their visions were or what their priorities were in terms of social justice um and i think in the Kenyan context, and I, I know things are different in different parts of, of Kenya, but I believe that um, grassroots action is like also cultural practices that communities have held strongly. And they say, you will not move us from this. And I think that strong, healthy foundation is what is important to social activism. You need, uh, you need that foundation that is not moved. We will not be bribed. Uh, this is what we believe, and that foundation is what carries the rest of the country, the rest of the nation, I mean, all the layers up to the parliament, to the government. I know some government officials who cannot 
go to a grassroots level and try to change a, a culture or a habit. They have no power when it comes to that. So I think, yeah, they, it's the foundation. I think, yeah, just to agree on what Michelle has also said. Yeah, it's so important to note the need for um, cultural restoration or even just like maintenance because often like myself, I work with a lot of young leaders. I know we're all under, we're either 25 or younger. Um, so you do often associate grassroots action with a younger generation trying to change the old ways as they call them. But it's also really important to have community leaders who are older who can talk to the cultural competencies that need to be met because you can't lose that while you're fighting for something and, and you also need to be able to understand why a collective of people may not immediately see why you're trying to affect that change if that belief or that way of life has been there for so long um, so that's a fantastic point thanks for sharing if anyone else has anything i will pause for a minute and then we can move on. Okay. Something I'm learning and I'm practicing in this, try not to count, is being able to comfortably sit with silence on Zoom calls because they are so awkward in comparison to normal in-person interactions. Um, but yeah, so if everyone's okay, we're going to pause on this conversation and I encourage you all to either reach out to each other or us if you um, would like to continue this conversation outside of the Zoom call ever. Um, but now we are going to talk about barriers and hurdles and Sid's going to take that away with us today. Okay, awesome. So um, I'm just going to bring up before this, I just want to try and share the screen. Oh, oh, why is this so different all of a sudden? Okay, sorry, just got to set up the whiteboard here. We're just going to um, start with the barriers and hurdles. I um, want to chat about the barriers to grassroots action organizations. So to get this started, just wanting to brainstorm um, for the next five minutes or so on what barriers um, or hurdles you can think of or have experienced in your own role as an activist um, throughout your time or just in any sort of situation that you've heard of the kind of barriers. I think probably one of the biggest barriers is fear. You know, that um, you're putting your head above the parapet to say, you know, this is not right. You, you're, you're scared of what other people, how other people will react. Um, that's the first one that comes to mind. I think the first one that comes to mind for me would be trust. Um, maybe that is linked to fear a little bit. I think um, it takes a very long time for um, that grassroots level communities, individuals to, to trust, especially if you are an outsider and you're trying to um, work in the area of advocacy uh, within the community, that you, you really need um, to find the right people to enter and work with. Otherwise, like there's just a trust and suspicion in some ways. Uh, like, who is this? Well, you know, where they come from? You know, who has come with them? Uh, until they trust that, oh yeah, they've come with somebody that we know. It's uh, you just can't permeate. You can't break through the barriers. No, I really appreciate that because I really um, appreciate how you brought in the relationship part. So the whole part of fear and in combination with the trust, I think is huge because it's needing to build that up 
to build that trust. And like, and again, with the, how we were just talking about the foundation as well. So if there isn't that secure foundation, then mm. fear comes into hand and that can, all those emotions. just just thinking of, I think some of it might be our, our own limiting beliefs that that can you know can have an impact limiting yeah. not omitting yeah so if we don't yeah. think something is possible if we don't think that we can change it then um, that can be a barrier to actually thinking, you know, why would I do this? You know, it's just such a wicked problem that I, I can't do it on my own, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So we sort of sit in that, um, you know, in that freeze state where we actually don't do anything. Mm. I think also... Um with what I've experienced uh, or seen, uh, I don't know if I can say it's uh, maybe competing interests or uh, competing, um, um, you know, organizations or I, I'll give you an example. I, I did, I was doing a baseline survey in Kibera. Kibera is one of the, one of the big slums, I think in Africa, it's in Nairobi. And I remember um, I had created a very good rapport in one of the home visits. And uh, as we finished our, you know, the conversations, and then the, 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 the ladies were just so friendly. They're like, ah, Mabel, thanks. At least you, we can tell you, you know, uh, we can tell you what's going on, what we are looking forward to. But I tell you, we feel that we have really been overstudied. We, Kibira has been overstudied. There is millions of organizations. This one is coming to do this. This one is coming to do this. Everybody wants to come and study us. Um, so I think they were just feeling they were like specimens, you know. Every organization is coming because they want to study Kibera because they've had it's the biggest slum in, in Africa. Um, and so they were saying for us, we've gotten to a point where uh, we've changed our intention and our intent that it's, it's now about uh, who is going to give us the highest amount of per diem per day, you know, who's going to give us good lunch money or who knows what, or we divide as a family, you will go to this organization workshop, the mother will go to this one, the father will go to this one. And I think that loses the whole aspect of trying to do any advocacy, any social activities, any activism. I mean, it loses the authenticity, the authenticity, the integrity. Uh, and for me, I find that as a challenge, um, especially for a person who's looking at uh, doing things with real, with integrity, with, uh, with honesty in all ways. Uh, I find, yeah, I just found that a bit disturbing uh, on, many, on many levels. Um, yeah. Well, and I would say that that is like the importance of like you're just driving home the point of of Nick's webinar is that it has to sort of come from the grassroots. And I am always suspicious of any kind of statistic that comes from um, comes from a household survey. I mean, I've I've done those household surveys or you know baseline survey surveys or whatever, and they're not coming from, you know, it's information gathering, which is fine. Um, but if you're looking for grassroots action, a household survey is not going to motivate it. So I'm just supporting your, uh, uh, what, what, what you're saying for sure. I like, like both your points, um, especially combined and 
love what the it's what you're saying and we brought up this word actually before um as we were prepping for this is the sjw like a social justice warrior in this sense and how that devalues um i mean social justice warrior when i first heard it was like oh that must mean a good thing but instead it's not um going deep into the roots with a grassroots kind of organization but taking like you said doing the not going deep enough or not going into the community and these types of they don't go deep enough and then it devalues those that are rooted in the community and are trying to do beneficial things so, yeah exactly yeah you're yeah the very right yeah it, it like institutionalizes a feeling or a you know yeah i i totally agree mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think for me, uh, a barrier from the get-go is just like, where to start, you know? You jump into a topic, so, you know, sexual reproductive health, that's massive. It could be looking at HIV and AIDS, it could be looking at gender equality, it could be looking at abortion or contraception or emergency contraception all separately, right? So when you know you're really passionate about an entire field, where do you start? Like, how do you, yeah, how do you jump in head first? You know, there's a gateway of knowledge available at your fingertips, whether it's through Google or a library, but it's just for, I, I know for me, it was really difficult at the beginning to try to find that niche that I really wanted to focus in to make sure that I was as educated as I possibly could be in continuously building on my foundation. Yeah. Well, and in Canada too, like I would be interested to hear like, so Canada has taken a, like a, a feminist international assistance policy, FIAP they call it. And um, so sexual and reprodu reproductive health rights are at the center of, you know, at least on paper, um, everything that we do. Um, so it would be, I, I'd love to hear, I just went to a conference last week <laughs> um, about, about that. And um, it would be interesting to hear where you feel you fit or land within that as a recent sort of graduate. I don't know. I, I, I just, uh, because I feel the same way. I mean, it's huge. It's, uh, you know, they say that we're, we're narrowing our focus, um, which they are as a country, but it's still a huge field. Yeah. Um, my master's supervisor, Dr. Angel Foster, she's worked on some phenomenal reports worldwide. So most of her work is in um, North Africa and the Middle East. Like that's what, that's what her specialty is in. And so she helped create a toolkit with, I believe the UN Family Planning um, Committee on what to do in refugee settings surrounding reproductive health. So they had finally as of last year um came to a consensus on the need for abortion services emergency contraception and contraception to be available in all refugee settings whether that be camps in um i think off the coast of, or in greece sorry or just like war-torn areas where these individuals are immigrating to other countries looking for help because in so many of these settings because of the like turmoil in the political system, um, you can expect sexual assault and rape, or even just for women who are not looking to have children in that area, you need to make sure that they have a way of preventing that while also being able to remain sexually active because just because you're in an area or you're in a rough part of your life doesn't mean that you don't want to be participating in those actions. So that was something she's worked on. However, we've seen through her work that while it's on paper, it's, all, it's really just on paper. And in many of those settings, they aren't actually meeting the requirements that the UN has set in place. And so I believe that's probably similar for what we've done here in Canada. It's on paper, but I'm excited and eager to see what they actually decide to do moving forward. Uh, 
I've, um, I've just been reflecting that um, between, between March, March this year uh, to now, um, I was reading yesterday that uh, we have over 100,000, I think I was telling D in one of the calls today, um, over 100,930 something uh, teenage pregnancies. Um, all this has happened just this period of COVID-19. This is across the whole country. Um, and I've just been wondering like what has happened uh, to that level where we can get that huge number of teenage pregnancies. And um, of course, there's a lot going on around with abortions and stuff like that. But it got me thinking that maybe um, people who are supposed to be talking about reproductive health, either uh, they don't know how to approach this issue because of the complexity of our society, especially when you are looking at uh, rural communities um, where you have religion, you know, do you talk about use of condoms? Do you talk about not use of condoms? Do you, uh, how do you begin having conversations about, um, you know, vaginas and the penis and sex and stuff like that? You know, like th there's just a complexity and I feel like th that could be something that is contributing uh, to less advocacy and social activism around this, this issue. Uh, especially in the local rural area, because people don't know anymore what is the right thing to do uh, at what point. Um, and those, who, especially those who have like the technicalities, I don't think they have the um, the right platforms at the right time, or they've been, or they've they lack knowledge on how to enter and approach and have realistic conversations that help them to make a point on what they're trying to address. Um, I think in the cities it's a bit better uh, because people are very proactive. There's, you know, social media and there's all these posters and stuff like that. But in the rural area where people are living, you know, like uh, 200 meters, that's when you find like another little house. It's a bit, it's a bit different um, uh, and maybe a bit difficult to begin to address these issues in a in a family setting, especially because some of this stuff is happening within a home. Um, yeah, I hope I'm making sense with all this. <laughs> oh, for sure. I think a lot of that, <laughs> make, like all of that made sense. Um, I love the, when you, uh, the complexity of the community, I think it's something so inherent and then it, it just, um, amplifies how it's really digging deep and the, like, needing that knowledge, needing to understand the community, to be a part of the community, to understand it, like with the whole, like goes back to the definition of grassroots, but I really like that connection. Okay, um, if anyone else would like to add, I've been, I, sorry, I honestly f forgot about the group chat and then I've been trying to put it all in real fast. So if anyone else has any other um, things that are popping up in their mind, I'll give another minute um, and then we can just wrap up on this. Mm -hmm. If we're all good. Um, so now that we have this beautiful, not beautiful, but a list of barriers and hurdles. Um, so we have created, I don't actually know how many breakout rooms now, Nick, but um, in those rooms we'd like to discuss and it's whichever um, you find and when you're wanting to talk about more. So two or three of the hurdles or barriers that we have or that you face and hope to overcome and then just chat about ways uh, you can manage those barriers. So uh, trying to problem solve basically. Um, and we'll give about 10 minutes to have that chat before we come back together and then we'll talk about it again all together. Yeah, so we'll have uh, just two rooms just so that we're a smaller group of like four and five in each. Um, yeah, so I'm going to push you all out there and you'll have a 60 second warning when you're being brought back to the main group for the like recap discussion. All right, so happy discussing. <laughs> oh, did it for force you? There we go.
Mm. There we go. Oh, and there we go. Look, now we have our own little private space while they're all wrapping up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I actually work with a, um, they're called, their short form is Scourge. They're on Loyola, I believe is the campus in, in mm -hmm. Illinois. Anyways, they, they do awesome work down there too. They're a university group. Where they um, provide access to emergency contraception and I'm actually helping them advocate for a vending machine on campus so that they can have access. Uh, and that's impressive because Loyola is a Catholic university. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. We work. I mean, we work with lots of campuses across the U.S., but we particularly love working with the historically Black colleges and universities and then the Catholic ones because they're the hardest. So they're mm -hmm. so rewarding yeah. when you beat them. Right, good. <laughs> awesome, so welcome back everyone from your breakout rooms. Um, so now we're just opening up back the discussion to have it more in uh, all of us back together. Um, and just discuss whatever the kind of hurdles and what you kind of came to the conclusion of um, with overcoming those barriers. And <laughs> sorry, <I'm> gonna... <laughs> I love it. The cat um, wants in. <laughs> oh gosh, I love cats. Um, yeah, so just opening up the floor to whatever uh, was discussed and uh, what you feel like sharing. So we, in our group, we talked about um, when it comes to sharing information and some people don't agree with you, um, a way we can get around this is kind of finding a different angle to approach because you no, know, everyone understands things differently and sometimes they need a different explanation in, in a different way to understand it and maybe it's not that they don't want to agree with you but it's that they just need a different explanation yeah. <laughs> i can bring my cat up here too oh, uh, she's being absolutely persistent <laughs> i keep popping her back on the floor and then she's back up again Kim, you might want to share, given that you kicked our conversation off into a totally different tangent, what we talked about. You're on mute. On mute, so sorry. Um, so yeah, I was curious, being I think the only person from the US, uh, how we, we talked about both, you know, how precarious uh, reproductive rights are right now in the US and have been since uh, Roe v. Wade be, was, became law, um, and uh, also, um, you know, I was wondering if it was like that so much in other countries, and, um, and also we talked a little bit about sex ed in the U.S. and sort of how it, it really varies. Like my kids got what we thought was really good sex ed, and then they're 25 years old, and I, they tell me that it was terrible, you know, that it was basically uh, just fear-based, and um, and yet they had sex ed, whereas they went off to college and met people from other parts of the country who had either abstinence-based or none. Um, so just talking about the, the variety and importance of good Sexual, sexual education. And in some ways I find it's hopeful because I feel like it's, even though there's like two steps forward, one step back, that there is the, I'm, when I talk with my kids' friends, um, it seems like they're, they're so much more knowledgeable uh, about things than I was at their age, um, certainly. But yet it's, it's access and knowledge is uh, not always available. Yeah, I agree with that because um, Nick and I have conversations a lot about how in high school we had sex ed, but again, it was pretty much fear-based and it, you know, there was, 
they, they talk about things, but it was like, but don't do this because this is going to happen to you and it's really, really bad. And there was no um, scientific explanation behind it. So, and I think that's why Nicola wanted to create Thrive Like a Girl is because we want to allow people to get more information and the proper information and to make sure that they're not afraid of sex education. So, yeah. Yeah, I always joke, um, if any of you have ever seen the movie Mean Girls, the scene about the, I think it was the gym teacher was like, don't have sex because you'll get pregnant and die. And that is pretty much what the Catholic <laughs> system here does. Like, I think, I mean, my sister's just under six years younger than me and she had the same crappy experience through high school. So it hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. I just truly like kind of the connection between the two groups as well when you're saying when you have people that don't agree with what you're trying to advocate for and how now well like what we realize and like what thrive like a girl is doing like exactly what grassroots is like trying to dig into like what the bigger pro issues and it's something i like oh because i also went to a catholic school so had the same education <laughs> so in that way digging deeper and being like okay this is obviously an issue and you're gonna have backlash, obviously, but if you are more community-based and you allow people to come to you in all the, and so many different resources and giving different ways for them to reach out, that is a way to move around people's different beliefs and allow others to ask questions. And again, using different lingo, just being like, oh, what, like just coming at it from different angles is always best, but also allowing so many different access points for those trying to get that information, I think is, it was just really cool how I feel they kind of intertwined both the groups were talking about it in different ways. Sorry, I use my hands a lot as well, so. <laughs> exactly. It's right, I'm, vi I'm visual, I need the hand signals, that's good. So how do people find Drive, drive for the Girls? Drive, do I get that right? Right. Thrive like a girl. Um, what do you mean by how do they find like the community? How do they accept it? Yeah. Yeah. Um. So. <laughs> so great. Um. We've had some like really great feedback from parents and guardians that are really excited about there being uh, youth programs in their community for their young daughters. So we offer two programs. Uh, one for ten to thirteen year olds and one for fourteen to sixteen with a, a young adult group coming up hopefully this fall. Um, so the funny part about it is we haven't actually run a full program yet because COVID-19 happens. So oh. yeah, but so far it's been really great response. Um, I actually am in the process of partnering with the YWCA so that we can use their space and their networks to help promote what we do. Um, so fingers crossed we'll be doing some summer online virtual stuff and we are planning to do their March break camps next summer for the students but yeah the COVID-19 has not been our friend this year it's like every hurdle you can have we've experienced in the last six months so but you know what you look how resilient you're, you're getting and you're sharing your knowledge this is we're a test for you as well you Absolutely. Know, we're, in, we're another test for you and you know you put your hands up to do this this awesome thing um, and go, okay, we're going to go on this conference and we're going to do this and, you know, and share your knowledge and get some of our knowledge as well. So you've got to add that into your toolbox as well, because if it wasn't for COVID-19, you might not have done this. Absolutely. Yeah. Every cloud has a silver lining and Absolutely. there's been some great progress in the weirdest ways that have come out of the last four months. So I'm really excited about this. I'm so glad that you guys all wanted to join us today because my amazing co-hosts have been my <laughs> backbone for the last six months every time I'm like ripping my hair out and I can't thank them enough. I don't thank them enough. So guys, I love you. Thank you. <laughs> can, I, can I just ask Nick, uh, she, ha, what's behind the that she, ha? she stroke her? Sorry? Like in your, yes. 
Yes. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, in in my background, we often will put our pronouns just because not everyone I work with or that we will work with in our lives identify by the pronouns that match what their stereotypical gender may be. Um, so it's just so that if people don't go by traditional pronouns, they feel comfortable sharing it because they're in a space that they can. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, this has been awesome. Uh, I think that I'm just trying to look over sorry, my notes very quickly here. Um, but if anyone else has any other type of hurdles or any, even any questions for us as well, just if you have questions about, oh, what about this hurdle? Like I, we discussed and we don't like have, it didn't really come to a conclusion. Um, I can give a minute or so if anyone has any other questions. Um, or otherwise, if you have further questions, once we move on from this uh, segment, again, chat or just uh, if you want to chat with us further as well, then we're obviously more than happy to chit chat. I, I have a question. Um, is Do you find, and, and this is uh, probably dating me too, but that just the topic in general is a barrier, be, that people are not comfortable necessarily talking about sexual reproductive health or or is that not really an issue anymore that is a very good question i think it i personally am a, i i get what you're saying because i come into contact with people that do not want to talk about this subject or they, it is like an uncomfortable because we repress a lot of our sexual like even in different beliefs i think sexuality mm -hmm. is really repressed so um coming to that, I'm a very open person and I think I might talk about even like periods and like I am super open and that might hit people in the face and they go, oh wow. And I go, well that's <laughs> part of my life, unfortunately. <laughs> so, um, but that's almost my way of also being like, oh, like doing little breadcrumbs and stuff like that. And that's only my personal view on that. But I think that hopefully by also posting things like this with five like a girl and it's we have sections that are put towards sexual health and all that like all the and sex ed even mm -hmm. in the programs which it alters for ages obviously but just those things hopefully are little nuggets that they like slowly evolve because i do agree and generationally mm -hmm. like the discussions that i have with my nan, grandpa, grandma, all the, it's very different than conversations that I'm having with um, people my own age or younger where I find that they are, it's way more main, like open and mainstream in that sense. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's helpful, but it's definitely. Yeah, well, that's encouraging just to know, because I think like normalizing talking about it is a, like the first step, especially among men. Like it, it seems like men are not there yet, you know, at least my age men, <laughs> but hopefully younger men are. Oh, I'm very happy to and I were on a call, was it yesterday, <laughs> Mabel, when we, we ended up, there was like a whole group of us as about, I don't know, 15 or so women and about four men. And it ended up a discussion like this. And the women were all, rah, 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 and, and access and, and exactly. having to make and the men right. were like <laughs> yeah they were all you could just see them. they want to crawl away oh. um, but it, it was very it, it, it was it was funny but there was also um uh, and, and i think men do this quite often there was one of the guys who said um like sisters you know i i agree i agree and on a lighter note and tried to take it off somewhere else. And the women were like, no way. <laughs> <No way. laughs> we are not living. <laughs> it was very funny. It was good, wasn't it? Oh, oh my God. We've had some really good, like, interesting experiences. Like, uh, did you remember this morning uh, in one of the sessions where we were trying, uh, there was a lot of hitch, hitch ups, I think, with the internet, with the, um, the adolescents, the work with the adolescents, yeah. the one hour. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, those were really powerful conversations, but the internet was just not working. I mean, oh, no. by the time we were beginning, we had already gone to like 30 minutes already, and it's a one-hour yeah. session. I was just like, oh, I hope something will work out. For the girls 
had questions and they had yeah. so much like stuff going on around issues of adolescence child marriage and, yeah, yeah yeah i mean i wanted to share like the kenyan experience i felt like it would help to solve something but there was just no space at all to just even put in my voice because it was that hey wow mm, yeah mm, mm. yeah and, and maybe that's part of it you know there's a lot of people having these conversations um and who else do you know you know or who else do we know that we can point towards you to connect them up and and find right. what else is happening in the world who's having these discussions like i was saying in our little breakout room that you know you get to that uncomfortable point where you just yeah, just have to move past it. And I'll say when I was in Indonesia and couldn't speak the language and I was in a chemist, look, Michelle knows the story. And I had to buy sanitary pads, but I don't know how to ask for that. Like what aisle are they in? I looked around, I couldn't find them anywhere. So I, I ended up, it was all by sign language. And um, eventually- Please do the action, D. And just get to that point where I went, you know what? This is what I need. And I kind of squatted with my hands in between my legs, making gushy <laughs> motion. And the girl went, ah, oh, this way. And I'll show you that. But I had to get, that was like 15 minutes of trying. I tried hygiene, sanitary, pad, tan. I tried every word, uh, every act, everything. And I got to that went charades it is then right <laughs> I, I, I <laughs> and we often get to that don't we where you get past uh, that frustration and go I, I i just need this we need to talk about it with the men with the community we, mm -hmm. ne we need this I, i'll tell you one story um it's just linked again to the issue of you know trying to explain something it's not it's not related to reproductive health but it's just a story linked to what you're saying so we were in a restaurant somewhere, I don't remember where, but we were with this, um, this guy who had just come from one of the local communities and he, he wanted uh, to order uh, in the restaurant uh, chicken breast and he didn't know what to say. So he pretty much was like chicken breast, like chicken and touching his, his chest. We were just laughing, we were just like, oh my goodness. <laughs> So <laughs> you were desperate times, desperate yeah. measures. <laughs> yeah. I could talk about this stuff for days. So, <laughs> but to um um to continue. Uh, so I love all this. This is so good because I think that the whole point and like this whole interaction that we're all having right now is just like the whole point of the community aspect. So it's so nice to kind of end this section with the barriers and hurdles being like, well, as long as you're in the community and you're continuing to strive for the community, a lot of these hurdles can be done as if we root deeper and if we dig deeper um, to find different ways. Um, like the roots, it makes me think of the roots and how the roots like work around the soil. So just a little imagery there, if that's how people's brains work. Um, but now, so we're gonna uh, pause on this conversation. Again, open to any uh, more uh, discussion um, in the chat, or if you wanna talk with us further on it, just let us know. Um, so then, yeah, we're gonna move on to our final discussion today. Um, and that will be Adriana taking over for sustainability. <laughs> All right, so I just want to let everyone know I'm aware of the time, uh, but we are allowed to go over a little bit, right? Yes, it shouldn't take that long. It'll it be should be good. I made the mistake of saying to the girls, "You're the last session. Do what you want." <laughs> That's exactly how right. she said it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we are going to be talking about sustainability and activism work. So we're going to look at it through a specific lens. So um, sustainability of the actual work itself requires input such as funding, materials, space, and time, and a whole bunch of other things. But the personal cost to grassroots action can be something that becomes insurmountable and the root cause for barriers. So we wanna focus the last part of our discussion on ways that we can sustain ourselves as activists. So, um, kind of 
making sure that the burnout doesn't happen and making sure that we're taking care of ourselves. So the first question we want to ask um, is what are ways that we can feel burnout in activism? So what does burnout feel like? Um, and it might be different for everybody, but yeah, we'll have a little discussion about that. So if, every, if anyone wants to share, you can go right ahead. I'll, I'll start something. Um, I think part of it is looking out for it in each other, um, you know, and, and looking for little signs and, and symptoms. Like I'll, I'll say to Michelle sometimes, um, I've noticed that you're spelling words more incorrectly in your typing today, like little things, you know, what's going on? Are you tired? Do you need a rest? That kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I think part of it is that kind of looking out for each other. Uh, I mean, yeah, we've got to look out for our own kind of, um, red flags, um, and when they come up and, and know them, but our tribe can help us identify our own as well. Um, so if they're pointing them out to you, you know, if Michelle's saying to me, you're a bit bitchy on that call, I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, you know, maybe I need to check myself, like, what's going on? Do I need a rest? Um, and, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there, but, but look, looking out for each other as well. Yeah, because you don't always know what burnout is. Maybe we don't. Yeah, know. absolutely. People to support you, that, that is important. Mm. You do get buried in your passion sometimes, and you forget that you're just, that's what you're doing, and you're just buried in it. So sometimes you actually have to, I, I have done this before when I'm working really hard on something, I block space out in my calendar to, to turn off from it. Don't read, don't look, don't be on your computer. Mm -hmm. Block yourself out some time and make time for yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, even thinking Fiona, like, you know, it's 6 a.m. for us now. The three of us have been up for more than 24 hours, right? So I know that today, if I see either of you sending emails, I'm going to be, stop that. Like, <laughs> well, have if a you're break, go to bed, have a sleep. Like, <laughs> if you're seeing us send the emails, we're going to be saying to you, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's true. You don't have to be superwoman all the time. Mm -hmm. You have to remember that. And vulnerability is powerful. Mm. Mm -hmm. And it's about um, the three of us work with the art of hosting principles and it's actually um, one of the practices in, within art of hosting um, which blends beautifully with with ABCD and um, is about hosting yourself um, and about it being a practice you know being a little bit more mindful of of where you are and being able to ground yourself and what are the practices that help you host yourself so that when you're working like that whole self-care thing if you actually don't look after yourself you're you can't look after others um yeah so it's a bit oh, sorry i just saw you had, didn't see you'd written in fourfold d yeah, I'm just putting a link. Just, yeah um it's a really good practice to look at because it actually helps the way you work in in communities and and in you know thinking about where your head's at at certain times with depending on what you're doing and and it practicing that also means you can have an understanding of how other people are working and where they might be practice where they might be in that at the moment as well so Would you like to move on to that question? 
Um, so just a, just a brief explanation, just to sum that all up. So burnout and activism can look like a bunch of things as we have discussed. Uh, it can be inability to make decisions or stay focused, um, feeling that the activism is taking over your life, uh, feelings of hopelessness, negativity, loss of purpose, and they can, um, these feelings can manifest physically into muscle tension, headaches, and more. So a lot of fatigue overall. And let's talk about why we think this burnout happens. So someone thought a 48 hour online on conference was a bloody good idea. <laughs> yep. um, no, in all honesty, I think it happens when um, we either don't check ourselves or we're not listening to our tribe. Yeah. I think sometimes, or we think we're um, Wonder Woman and can do it all. Right. That's what I understood. Like, you know, setting very high standards for yourself and you no. must achieve them. Like, I must achieve them. <laughs> we wouldn't do that. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. did I miss something? <laughs> we wouldn't. We wouldn't be overachieving and setting high standards, would be Mabel. We wouldn't be doing that. <laughs> I just love, especially with the why, because I think that also, I had this neat uh, conversation uh, with my sister when she was. She's just doing. She's doing schooling, and she talked about how she's trying to help her friends. She's trying to do this. She goes and she's looking at her schedule, and she went. It all fits in in the time. Like I have the time for it. If I, I might be really busy, I have all the time. And I said, but emotionally. Do you have time for that? And she went, what do you mean emotionally? Like, that's like a, that's not a part of me. I'm like, well, it's a huge part. And you might say, but then she was crying and goes, but I don't know why I can't handle it. I said, well, cause maybe emotionally you can't handle it. So mm -hmm. looking at it in such a different perspective where you might say, yeah, I have all the hours in the day to get everything done, but my emotional timeline doesn't work in that sense. And I think, it works differently for everyone. And then just recognizing like, nope, that is my give out point. And that's when I clock out. Yep. Okay. So in short, um, direct action can stir up extreme emotions and can even be traumatic for some people. Um, you can experience extraordinary things very quickly. Um, this might be due to also learning more about injustices in your activism. So burnout can also happen when you're taking on too much of a role. So it's important to know like where your role is and kind of stay in that. And I know a lot of people um, myself, I like to control every little thing. So <laughs> I need to check myself a lot and be like, hey, wait, this is not part of your role. Simmer down, take a step back. So for example, in reproductive health justice, your fight for justice could be specific to gender, to gender equality, access to health services, access to contraception, emergency contraception, uh, and access to abortion, the list goes on, of course. Um, while every leg of this overarching theme is very important, it may be too much for you to take on every fight, so to speak. So by sharing the cause of the strong core team, you're able to hit all points you'd like to without overloading yourself with content and experience that may be too much to handle. So it um, is more beneficial if you have a team but also if you're focusing on one part of uh, reproductive health justice or having a person on your team for each thing that you'd like to focus on, just so you don't experience that burnout and you um, fight effectively. So the third question, um, how can we best support ourselves as individuals? So if there's any way that you do self-care, what is, what is a way that you um, actively self-care? 
I go for a swim. But I'm not allowed at the moment because the pools are closed. Mm. <laughs> and I think it's a bit of ditto of all the things that we've spoken about, but it's that, you know, t giving yourself some time. That's that time out, you know, um, whether it's reading a book or even watching crappy TV or something like that or having a, having a bath or um, whatever it might be is actually find, find your thing, mm. you know, find what it is that, that, um, that, that sort of wraps around you so that when you, whenever you're doing it, you feel like you, you're totally in that moment, in the moment, you know, um, rather than thinking about what you should have done, what you could have done, what you're going to do. Um, just be absolutely whatever you can do to be in the moment. We and have I think part of that is also the, the, um, that you can plan for that, you know, and that's where <laughs> if you're watching your triggers or you're listening to your tribe, that you can go, oh, yeah, okay. I know I've got another couple of big days. I'm hearing what they're saying or I'm noticing it in myself. So I'm going to plan. So, like, I know tonight after I wake up after a full day I know tonight I'm going to be sitting with my feet up watching some really shitty tv that like the bachelor my daughter even laughs at me I'm like bring me my wine you know and I sit there and watch and it's just my total and if I fall asleep I fall asleep doesn't matter if I miss the show and I'm just totally immersed in me being relaxed and that's what's really important. And if then tomorrow I wake up and I go for a swim or a walk or whatever, that's a good thing for me too. But I think you can plan for it is the more you know your burnout points or your triggers or the signals, the more you know them, the more you can plan for them. That's very true. Mm -hmm. I, and I think I was saying before, I block out parts of my calendar and I've learnt to say no to people. Um, and the other thing that, you know, it's just, I have to, I have started listening. I'm only, you know, 50, but it only took me the last two years to start listening to other people who would tell me, I think you need to slow down now. So it took me a long time to actually eat acknowledge that that's what needed to happen as well because I didn't want to fail at anything so I also now realize it's okay to fail sometimes mm -hmm. I think for me um, my my big sister um, and my family they are very happy that I've been locked out of Nairobi uh, because I'm now living <laughs> <laughs> I'm living in a rural area and I've been forced, like, because of the circumstances, I'm going to the farm, I'm planting tomatoes, I've been planting yeah. vegetables, <laughs> um, I've been chasing birds, they're trying to make a nest in the house where I'm staying, I'm seeing squirrels, you know, some of them try to run in the farm, I've begun to plant flowers and, you know, like, patch up the fences, uh, doing a lot of cleaning, you know. I'm a classical singer, so I spend a lot of time sometimes like singing my voice practice and I play also at trombone. So like Do you I know that? what sorry? Are you gonna wait, sing wait, for wait, us wait, now? Yeah. No, 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 no. It's like so it's at night, people will be like, What? What is going on? <laughs> um another time, I'm sure I am sure another time. But um they Can were you just happy. <laughs> Excuse me, Fiona. I'm writing it down. Mabel will sing another time. Yes, in, in our next, uh, the next 48-hour conference <laughs> next year, I call dibs. <laughs> I'll sing the national anthem. Um, but uh, because of that, my, my sister, she's always so concerned. For me. She's like, Mabel, you never rest. You sleep late. So now you've been forced to actually relax. Like, seriously, mm -hmm. I feel like it's just been a time to chill out look what is around you just uh, connect with other things and it's been amazing i have now the problem is now i've already created other things 
I've seen other things that I need to create. When I go back to Nairobi, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this. But it's been like forced, uh, relaxing, and I feel refreshed so much. Like really, that's why I'm doing all these conferences, joining every other one. What about you, Kim? You know, I as I've gotten older, I've realized how much I do need to slow down. And uh, so I, for me, it's basically getting outside, whether it's like being outside, whether it's walking or running. Um, it, it, that is a space where I can kind of clear my head. And, um, and I have noticed when, when thing I, like I've learned to say no, which took me many years to learn to say. <laughs> um, and I also, when I'm not saying no, and I'm starting to feel overwhelmed, I now at least recognize like, okay, back up, you know, like, yeah, um, and so th that's been really helpful. But it's basically for me, it's, and, and I, and I notice, you know, like if, when I do take, cause I'm in a strange position where I'm the right now, like sort of the only one in my position. I don't really, I work with everybody and nobody at the same time because I, I'm the only uh, ABCD Institute employee. And every, although everybody else is working, you know, at the same time, you know, all around the world, but um, I don't have, like, I don't have someone, if I go on vacation to, to say, oh, can you handle this while I'm gone, <laughs> you know? So I'm always working, even when I'm some, you know, to some degree, and which, you know, most people are also, but, um, but I've just learned to figure out how to, like, I appreciate when I do take a break, like how much more ready I am to like come back and ready to go, you know, so that, that it, I value that time. I think that actually brings up another point, Kim, because I know that um, the demands that are put on you by the community, the ABCD community sometimes, when they don't realise that it's just you. They think that the Institute is this big thing and there's oh, all this true, money true. and people right. and you know, outside, yeah. we'll throw it all. Yeah, yeah, that's what I meant, like the outside community. Yeah. We'll throw all this stuff at Kim to do. And um, so I think what it, what it brought up for me with you saying that then was about being um, transparent and making yeah, sure that people idea. know this is what I can do, this is what I can't right. do or I'm not willing to do. Right, or this is why it took me several days to get back to you on an email. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. And that, yeah. Even yeah. that I don't so even you know work. next to it. Right, like I don't even work full time, you know. Um, so I'm like trying to squeeze all this in. Um, but that's mm -hmm. the transparency. That's key. I really appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. <clears throat> I know I try and be really mindful of it when I ask you or send you anything. I'm like, does Kim need this? <laughs> but, right, which I appreciate, but then at the, the same time, I don't want people to feel like, oh, I can't ask her to yeah. do it. You know, yeah, but yeah. I, I appreciate that, yeah. But I, it is, I think, that to be transparent, because I think when I started and people thought, like there was a picture on the website at Northwestern of the Institute, it was a building, and, and I was like- Yes, that's, that's right. Is, that is the front of the building in the tiny office on the, the desk I work at, but it made it look like it was like this huge institute. Mm -hmm. That's right. I remember that. All right. So, um, just to sum it up. Um, sustainability is self care and it involves getting adequate sleep um eating a balanced diet regular exercise just getting up <laughs> being aware of your workload um of course we are not robots so <laughs> um we need to check in and it's important to take care of ourselves in mind body and soul to ensure our um that we can give our best self to the cause. Like I said before, if we're not at our best, then we can't give our best to what we're fighting for, so. Very good. So with that, um, we'll quickly take a photo and then I just have like a last little wrap up and you can all go to sleep, except for us North Americans. <laughs> we'll be riding out the rest of the day. <laughs> um, you but yeah, you can so go to sleep too. Yeah, I mean, I could, but that would be really weird because then I'll probably be up at 2 a.m. my time and then not know myself. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so I'll just quickly take a screenshot. So, if, 
you'd like to be on camera. Um, yay. So ready. Hold on, let me prep my thing. Three, two, one. Awesome. All righty. Um, yeah, so we hope that you are able to take away something from our session on grassroots action. I know that um, including the people that were popping in at the beginning, I've even had some new insight shared with me and I'm really excited that we were able to do this and chat with all of you because as much as we're in different contexts globally, we are all experiencing the same barriers and hurdles and are all on the same journey. So it's really important to be able to connect with people around the world. Um, but yeah, other than that, thank you so much for joining us, especially uh, Michelle, Mabel, Fiona, and Dee. We are so happy that you decided to stay up late and be with us. And thank you, Kim, for being our co-host and allowing us to use your Zoom because that makes it so easy. <laughs>